So this book launch is co-hosted with the Democratic Innovations Research Unit at the Goethe University in Frankfurt. Um, uh, the kind people, um, Brigitte and her team, invited uh, Selene Nicole and myself to Frankfurt as well to present our book Research Methods in Deliberative Democracy. And we are very happy to return the favor and co-organize this uh, book launch of, um, for this fantastic book. We are very excited to talk about the book. And at the same time, this is also the first seminar in our seminar series this year. So we're excited that everybody is back. Um, it's now 7 p.m. in Canberra in the evening. It's 9 a.m. in the morning in Europe, where Brigitte and I are. I'm in Vienna. Brigitte is in Frankfurt. Um, for the University of Canberra, I would like to acknowledge that um, the university is on the land of the Nanawal people, the original custodians of Canberra. I would like to extend my respect to the elders past, present and emerging and appreciate the contributions they are making to the, the development of this region. So I'm going to briefly introduce Brigitte and then Brigitte and I will have a bit of a conversation about the book. Brigitte will tell um, us more about the book and then uh, we'll open it up for uh, discussions, for uh, questions from the audience. So Brigitte Geisel is a professor of political science and political sociology and head of the research unit on democratic innovations at the Goethe University in Frankfurt. Brigitte is really one of the leading figures in the field of democratic innovations, has done so much for the field in developing the field. Um, she's co-author of the recent deliberative mini publics together with our very own Nicole Curato and uh, several other co-authors. Um, she is co-editor of Evaluating Democratic Innovations and of Participatory Democratic Innovations in Europe. She has received a number of awards, including the Democracy Fellowship from the Harvard University's Ash Center, a senior fellowship from the Alfred Krupp Foundation, which allowed her to work on the current book that we're discussing today, and a Marie Curie Fellowship from the European Commission. So, Brigitte, we are so happy to have you here. Thank you for taking the time. Um, thank you very much, Hans. I'm really, really thankful that you organized this book launch and that you have me here. This is just wonderful. And um, I'm, I'm very happy to discuss my book with me. As we discussed before, this book is like a, um, a stone within a long row of other stones. So there are lots of more things to do on the topic, but this is where it is now. And of course, Hans, congratulations for the wonderful prize. Um, you well deserved, really you deserve it. It's I was so happy when I read it. So Thank anyway, you. but now I <laughs> Thank um, you, that's very kind. Yes, it was wonderful. Um and right. I say thank you very much to Seel and to Nicole and everybody who were here in Frankfurt. It was, we had such a good time here in Frankfurt uh, with all of you. So I don't want to take too much time talking about the book. Um, to explain it because we will have the discussion there more. It's more interesting, of course, to discuss it. But uh, for those who haven't read it, just very briefly, what are the basic concepts? I started um, with the observation that we political scientists seem to be very paternalistic. Um, democracy is in crisis and all of us have some certain ideas about what should be changed. And we have this book about deliberative, um, deliberative systems, uh, uh, open democracy, and we have lots of paternalistic ideas about what could save democracy, may it be social movements, or may it be sortitions, or may it be mini-publics. And when I read, read all these books, my impression was, yeah, but what if citizens or communities do not want deliberative systems? Or what if they do not want any autocratic alternatives? Or what if they don't want sortition or referendums? So um, my idea was to advance what um, Jen Mansbridge what said, that the task of political science is to help and to support communities in their search for how to govern themselves. So I focus, and the whole book is about supporting the idea of self-governing, inspiring citizens, inspiring communities to think about what kind
kind of democracy is best for them, considering their preferences, their resources, their needs, their specific problems. This is like the basic idea of the book, which means there is no one size fits all suggestions. There is no paternalistic idea about what communities should implement. Um, it's more about giving ideas inspire communities so that they can find out what is best for them. Um, which of course starts with the idea of participatory constitution making, constitutions which of course set the rule of the game, inspire this idea how deliberation can take place in communities to think about how they want to govern themselves and how they decide then themselves how this should work. And then after this constitutional moment, this participatory constitutional moment, the ideas that self-governing goes on in an ongoing process of con continuous monitoring, adaption by citizens, by participatory committees, which check whether the idea, the self-governing idea set in the constitution is really um, implemented and adapted to new changes. This also has a more idea of a more fluid idea of constitutions, which always adapt to the new generations and always adapt to the new needs of, of community citizens. Um, this could end in very different ideas, or this could end in very different forms of democracy. Some communities might be perfectly happy with a purely representative way of uh, governing. I mean, they might just be happy with their representatives, which are honest and uh, trustworthy, and they say, we don't need anything else. We don't need any deliberative systems. We don't need anything else. We are, pure, we are happy with our purely representative systems. Other communities can, of course, get rid of representation, have a sortition, parliament, or whatever. You see, there are lots of ideas that could happen. No one size fits all. Lots of ideas that communities could decide how, how to govern themselves. Um, this also, of course, means democracy is not a kind of a board game or a card game where we as experts explain citizens and then they just have to play along the rules we give them. This is not what democracy means. Um, it's about self-governing and this, as I said, is the my main thought that I tried to um, explain in my book, normative arguments, empirical arguments, some ideas about how to find which practices to use to um, to f deliberate and to make decisions on this kind of self-governing. So I think this is like a very short uh, description of the basic idea. And I'm very much looking forward, Hans, to your questions and of course the questions of the whole group. Yeah, thank you so much, Brigitte, for giving us this uh, introduction and a, a bit of an overview of the core argument of the book. So what uh, what was standing out to me in particular was a kind of, if if you will, a new revolutionary spirit or revolutionary tone of the book. Um, I first heard you speaking about the book in Innsbruck at the ECPR conference last year, and I was really inspired and, and uh, really surprised, and I felt like there was a new momentum here in your work. So you start the book with a quote from Oscar Wilde that says, a map, map of the world that does not include utopia is not worth even glancing at. Progress is the realization of utopia. And then you go on to argue that we need to search uh, for a new vision of democracy. And this is a quote from the book as well. So um, I went back to a bit of your previous work. Um, I have two uh, of your books here that have a different tone. Here, I feel that in many ways you endorse um, reform, uh, curing the democratic malaise. And in your current book, uh, you reflect on democratic reform and you say democratic uh, reforms are just band-aids mending one flaw or another without a vision to heal the whole body. This fiddling with symptoms abatement with a patch here and there does not suffice. So um, I feel like there's a new uh, revolutionary spirit here, at least that's my interpretation. And I wanted to ask you what, what changed in your thinking? What changed maybe in the world that inspired um, these, these new directions that you're taking here? 
Oh, wonderful. What a great question. <laughs> yes, um, I started, as you can see with the books, um, with evaluating democratic innovations. So I, the idea was I looked at democratic innovations and I tried to find out what can they meant? What can they do? Can they repair anything? Um, but I looked, I mean, as we all probably 10 years ago or 15 years ago, we looked at specific innovations. We looked at mini publics, we looked at referendums and we said, what can they do? Um, what can they yeah, what, what is the benefit or uh, the add-on? And at some point I realized um, that's that's just not what we need. We don't need these little band-aids every here and there, uh, these little add-ons uh, to represent democracy here and there. Um, I mean, I'm not the only one. This whole idea of more embedding comprehensive change um, is not just me who said that. It's I think there are several people working on this. I think my idea was really this, that we do not present um, we do not pretend that we know what is best. Nevertheless, as you see, I try to create a vision in this book. And I, I so much like this quote by, by Oscar Wilde. I mean, I know it's not an academic scientific quote and some people like were a little bit, I don't know, thought I should have a more scientific, scientific um, uh, entrance here. But I like this quote because I think, and that was also my impression when I wrote the book, I thought what I really need is to think broadly about new visions. I, I don't want to think again, just how to set up another mini public, which is important, of course, but um, I, I thought I, this is this is just not enough. I wanted to start to create a really more bigger picture. What what should be changed as a whole? I mean, this whole concept of you work on assemblages, Hans, others work on uh, this open democracy idea, or, um, all these ideas that have more this visionary uh, conceptualization of how to create democracy based on the concept of the rule of the people, not just, you know, what we have and then add on little things every now and there and hope that they can do a little bit something. Yeah? So this is the whole visionary approach that I um, that I ended up after working so so long for. I still work on evaluating innovations, of course, but uh, I think what we need is this more visionary approach, which has a more comprehensive thinking. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and I think the I, I I can totally see how the evaluating goes into the visionary approach. We need both. We need the assessment of what is happening, what is working, to create these new visionary ideas. So I, I find this very inspiring. Um, I wanted to go back to something you also briefly touched on in the in, in introducing the book about the role of the researchers um, in democracy. What can democratic or democracy researchers do as part of society, as part of this kind of process of uh, finding the right way to self-govern? Um, you say in the book, um, which I really like, that the, the book recommends a kind of democratic midwifery. So are birthing a new kind of democracy and the researcher has a, the role of helping society to find or communities to find their own visions of democracy. And you say that um, experts, academic experts, of course, they can understand the natural laws of the world. The hard sciences can understand how the world objectively works, but it's only a certain part of the world that they can um, explore while democracy is a human construct, it's made by people. And so if we take the promises and ideas of democracy seriously, we need to include everybody in constructing democracy in that way. So maybe you could say um, a bit more on the role of researchers. How can we, and I think most people of the mm -hmm. room um, will, will be very interested in this question. What can we as democracy researchers do to help mm -hmm. people um, find their own version and vision of democracy? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, as you said, when I thought about it, I came up with this idea of midwifery because I felt that that's that's what I want to do to help give birth to others, to other people, to to to, to, to inspire them, to um, make them think about how they would like to be governed or how to like to govern themselves and their communities. Um, so, um, in my book, I, I wrote, as as you nicely said, um, the idea that. Our role as scholars is to support and to inspire citizens and communities. This also means to give them information about what we find out with our, of course, 
scientific uh, methods about different kinds of innovations, how they work, what they can do, what they cannot do. So, I mean, to provide this information is very important. This is the one thing. This is our work as scientists. On the other hand, we can also just encourage them to think about more what they want to do. Um, you have worked on the topic as well, this idea to democratize the democratic theory, democratic theory. This idea theorists can check what what are the ideas of citizens, what they democracy, what they think democracy should do. Of course, then people the the studies on public opinion come in. I mean, we have all these surveys, but they are not sufficient. They just give a very um superfluous, very um not not very deep idea of what citizens want of democracy. And we have all these ideas of, or we have all these more deliberative or discursive methods which help citizens to think much more deeper what, what they want and what democracy means to them. Um, and of course, we have all the comparativists, people who compare, and they are also, they give lots of information about, it can give them to citizens, um, how democracy, different kinds of democracy, of democratic forms, practice, procedures, work in different contexts. So these are all this information we can give to citizens and then help them based on this knowledge to think about what they think is good for them or what might fit into their communities. Um, this is also a development. I think it's not only I suggested we have now all these ideas of open science um, which is a which is a development. I mean, also the, the European Union is European Union is working on this. This idea of to include citizens in our production of knowledge at different stages. I mean, at agenda setting, at also data collecting, and so on and so on. So I think this is a broader idea of including citizens more into our production of science. This is like the open science idea, and we could and should use it for our idea about what democracy is. And then this is the basic and the main idea uh, to help citizens to find out what is good for them. So you see it's different steps. It's connected to very a, a lot of different debates that are right, right now out there. Um, and But the end is the wit rivalry. That is like the end um, uh, the, or the, the final goal the final goal of all these different open science uh, surveys, um, evaluations of democratic innovations, and so on and so on. The final goal is the midwifery, the democratic midwifery to help citizens and communities to find out what is good for them, to deliberate and to decide what is what they want in their communities. So you see it's a whole bunch of different threads that come together and I just say, use all these threats and use them to reach the final goal of helping communities to develop what is best for them. Right. So that, of course, raises the question of citizen competences. And you speak about that in the in the book extensively. Um, so I, I still have to ask the devil's advocate question. <laughs> Do citizens have the, the knowledge, the capacities, the capabilities to self govern? Um, if you ask people out there, uh, how should democracy be organized? Should it be sortition um, or participatory budget? They might not know the, the terms. So what kind of engagement does it need? What kind of competences uh, competences do citizens have to um, self-govern, to produce a constitution and so on? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, you're right. I've written extensively in the book about it. I tried first to say what what do different authors and different schools mean when they talk about competences and they mean a lot of different things. Um, and my argument was then that self-governing democracies do not require a super competent citizen. I very much refer to Pateman's statement in the 70s. It was very bold at that time uh, when she said everything citizens need, need for participation, they learn when they participate. Um, so it's this um, educational idea of participation. Pateman said this like a couple of decades ago, and at that time she didn't have the empirical knowledge, of course, uh, that it's actually true. Um, 
Now we have lots of research on the topic. I mean, Chen Mansbridge, Okimo, or Juan, a lot of people working on this topic, and they found out that competences don't have to be, you know, absolutely comprehensively when you start with participation, but it they are learned, they are developed, citizens develop competences, they are develop democratic attitudes, they develop capacities, they develop willingness to participate while during the process of participation. And so my or what I try to strong argue in the book is um, that we that citizens don't have to be completely competent for self-governing, but that they learn while they participate. And that's also why I say in my book that I we need lots of different kinds of practices because different practices attract different people. Um, so we have the statistician, we have we need online participation, we have self-governing, self-selected um, referendums, uh, all kinds, a, la a large variety of different kinds of participatory options, which ensure that lots of different types of citizens are attracted by these different participatory options. And then they learn and then they develop um, their, their um, capacities. And we also know, I mean, Juan Fontes, for example, worked on this, that citizens participate and they gain competences when their participation is meaningful and consequential. So this is also something that's very important. I mean, when you offer participatory options which do not lead to any changes or which are not connected to decision making, which just take place and then they are forgotten, the recommendations made in these different um, uh, democratic practices, then this is not attractive for citizens. They will not learn anything. They will not gain competences. They might even be frustrated, what we have experienced very, very often. So it has the opposite effect. <laughs> but when participatory options are meaningful, are important for those who participate and have consequences, are consequential, have an impact, feed into decision making, then the chances that citizens gain competences are much higher. So summing up, I argue in the book that we need different kinds of participatory options and they must be meaningful and consequential and really have an impact. And when these requirements are given, chances that citizens learn gain, develop competences are very, very high. So this is my basic argument. Of course, I mean, there's always this question, what about <laughs> those who do not want to um, engage? Um, I also discussed this in my book and I said, yeah, why do people not want to engage? Because they can't, because they don't want, because they um, haven't been asked. This is what Schlotzmann and others have found out. And I think we have to address these three topics and give them the chance to participate, uh, give them, depending on their resources, give them those kinds of participatory options that they can actually use and ask them to participate, invite them. So these are the, some questions, these are some um, ideas that I think we know in help people to get involved also they have not been involved at, at, at the beginning so these are the uh, i think the inspiring or attracting um yeah contexts we can provide to make to invite them and to get them started and then as i said once they have started they gain their competences that's Great. Yeah, absolutely. So um, this is my final question before we open for the audience. You can all uh, start thinking about your your own questions, which we're looking forward to. Um, so the final question I wanted to ask, you paint this picture of these thriving um, democracies, these uh, thriving communities, and you make the argument to, to realize this, we need to step out of model thinking. So that's something that Mark Warren has uh, made an argument for in the past. Arkan Fung, Michael Seward in a similar vein, mm -hmm. um, said that 
just focusing either on one practice like deliberation or referendums mm-hmm. or uh, concentrating on one model such as a participatory deliberative direct democracy in a way um, makes us look on democracy in a too narrow way. So we need to bring all of these things together rather than looking through one particular lens. Um, you also mentioned here Landemore's Open Democracy and Lafon's uh, Democracy Without Shortcuts as examples of the concepts that emerge um, of this model thinking and say we need something new. So as a as a counter proposal, you propose the notion of thriving democracies, the concept of th- thriving democracies. So my question is, how are thriving democracies um, not models? How does this step out of the model thinking? Um, how is it not a concept similar to, let's say, open democracies? Why? How are thriving democracies different? And why is model thinking uh, hindering our democratic uh, visions and imaginaries, you think? Mm-hmm. Thank you very much, Hans. Also great question. Yes, I mean, as you said, models, in general, models should help to understand the world. That's that's obvious. Uh, but the mo- democracy research has attached, as you said, and others have said, have attached models too much to certain practices and procedures, elections, deliberation, referendums, which I think hinders communities to find out what they actually want, or which just assigns a certain model as or a certain practice or procedure as the only and the best way of governing us. And that is, I think, um, we need a, a very different approach. Um, that's why I say democracy is the rule of the people. We have to go back to these roots and not tell them, tell them democracy is if you have a deliberative system or democracy is when you have a direct democratic system or democracy is when you have a representative system. But to go back from these, don't attach democracy to a certain procedure, but attach democracy to the concept of the rule of the people from, from the outset, from the start, which means, as I've said before, this idea of participatory constitution making participatory decision-making, deliberation and decision-making on how to govern themselves, and then this idea of ongoing monitoring and adapting of democracy, of the democratic system, to make sure that it still fits to the community as it is. So it is not attaching a certain procedure. Say, if you have this procedure, then it's democracy. No, (laughs) to step back from this idea and say, um, you have to decide, deliberate and decide what's best for you. And not, um, yeah, not not, not attach or just praise or say, only if you have this form, only if you you have this practice, then it's real democracy. This is, we have to step back from this thinking and go back to to the roots and say, self-governing, it's the rule of the people from the outset, how they want to rule themselves. It's their own competence to decide on this. So this is the basic idea behind it. Thank you so much, Brigitte, for giving us these insights.